Okay, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Brother James, and I greet you once more in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. We're doing sort of a simulcast things uh, thing these days. We're recording on audio uh, feed for the preaching of the Cross radio broadcast, and we are recording a video feed that will be displayed at the uh, YouTube channel, James W. Knox Sermons, and other places on the internet. But we are studying the Bible book of Revelation, and this will be, this is a, a milestone for us, this will be lesson number 200, lesson number 200 in our study of this last book of the 66 books in the Bible, and it coincides with our arriving at Revelation 19, 11, and the matters pertaining to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to this earth. We believe the Bible, and because we believe the Bible, we believe there will be a literal second coming of the very one who died upon the cross and rose from the dead and ascended to the right hand of the Father. We believe this same Jesus shall so come in like manner as those disciples saw him go a long, long time ago. And, and we're going to be talking about that for the next several sessions. In chapter 19, verse 11, the Bible says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with the vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And you can almost hear the, the choral choir singing forever, forever. King of kings and Lord of lords forever, forever. And he is truly, surely coming again to take dominion of this old uh, earth. Now, the Day of Wrath is, first of all, a distinct event. It is separated from the time of the final judgment, the white throne judgment, by 1,000 years. It is an object distinct from the Day of Judgment. In the Day of Judgment, books are opened and searched and inquiries are made. Here in the Day of Wrath, no books, no inquiries. In the Day of Judgment, eternal sentences are meted out. In the Day of Wrath, the earth is cleared for the kingdom. The Day of Wrath has specific characteristics. The long-checked indignation of God bursts forth. The prayers of all saints for vengeance are answered. God shows his power on the vessels of wrath. The why doesn't God stop war argument is ended. And Christ himself is the executor of the punishment. The day of wrath finds four names given to the Lord. Faithful and true, an unknown name, the Word of God, King of Kings, and Lord of Lords. And the results of this second advent, over 500 Old Testament prophecies are fulfilled. All the wicked are subdued. Satan is bound. And the church is established as kings and priests upon the earth. All right, so heaven is open. Verse 11, and I saw heaven 
open. This is the fourth and final time in the book of Revelation that heaven is open. In chapter 4, verse number 1, after, the look, after this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And that is for the church to depart this world and enter into that place of joy with their Lord. In chapter 11, verse 19, and the temple of God was opened in heaven. And there was seen in his temple uh, the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and earthquake and great hail. And, and I, I'm, I'm content if you. Uh, want to differ and say this is the temple of God being opened in heaven rather than heaven being open. In chapter 15 and verse number 5, after I looked, uh, that I looked and behold the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. So technically, if we're just going to go strictly by the letter of what is written, there are two openings of the temple slash tabernacle in heaven. And there are two times when heaven is opened. One, for the church to go in with the Lord. And the last, for the church to go out with the Lord. In John chapter 10, Jesus prophesied of this uh, start and end of the church's brief trip to heaven. When people witness, they say, would you like to go to heaven when you die? Would you like to spend uh, eternity in heaven with Jesus? And, and it all sounds good until you read the Bible. And we're going to heaven, but not for long. And we're coming back down here to this earth for a thousand years, and then we'll be in the new Jerusalem. So anyway, John chapter 10, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, Climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. Verse number seven, then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door. Verse number nine, I am the door. If by me any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. So Jesus Christ saves those who trust in him. And at a, at a day not yet uh, revealed, the date not revealed, but the event revealed, he is going to descend from heaven with a shout. He is going to catch up the dead and living saints that we will meet him in the air, and he will escort us through the door into heaven, Revelation 4, verse 1. But he said in John 10, they'll go in, and they'll come out. And so in Revelation 19, verse 11, the door is opened again, and out come the sheep to do what? Find and enjoy the green pastures. The renovated earth in the millennial kingdom will be the place where the Lord, the good shepherd, and his sheep will, will dwell together uh, for those 10 centuries as he rules and reigns as the king of Israel. And praise the Lord for that. Now we read about a white horse. The Lord is riding upon uh, this white horse. Job chapter 39 offers praise of this mount. Job 39, and let's read verses 19 through 26. Hast thou given the horse strength? Hast thou clothed his neck with thunder? Canst thou make him afraid as a grasshopper? The glory of his nostrils is terrible. He paweth in the valley. He rejoiceth in his strength. He goeth out to meet the armed man. He mocketh at fear and is not affrighted. Neither turneth he back from the sword. The quiver rattleth against him. The glittering spear and the shield he swalloweth the ground with fierceness and rage. Neither believeth he that it is the sound of the trumpet. He saith among the trumpets, ha ha. And he smelleth the battle afar off, the thunder of, cap of the captains and the shouting. Doth the hawk fly by thy wisdom and stretch her wings toward 
the south, and God goes on with his questioning. So there he describes this, this great horse racing into battle, not with fear, but with joy. And the, the horse here in this passage is not concerned with the army arrayed against him, but is, is thrilled for the challenge and the opportunity to ride forth into this great war. So Christ is coming. He's coming mounted upon a white horse. Remember the counterfeit rider on the white horse back there in Revelation 6. And so the Bible says in verse 11, he that sat upon him was called faithful and true comets. One, one name, you cannot separate them. It is a name for the, the words are capitalized capital F, faithful, capital T, true, faithful and true, this could only be the Lord Jesus Christ. He identifies himself by the former name in Revelation 1.5. You're going to see now in these, in these second coming passages how uh, Revelation loops back around to the beginning. Revelation 1.5, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the latter name in 314, these things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. In chapter 3, verse 7, chapter 3 and verse 7, and the angel of the church of uh, Philadelphia write, these things saith he that is holy and he that is true. And then in chapter 3 and verse 14 again, uh, we read that, uh, faithful and true. So faithful, Revelation 1, 5, Revelation 3, 14. True, Revelation 3, 7, Revelation 3, 14. For thousands of years, millions of men and women have held out hope for the second coming of Christ and, and all that will result therefrom. They've always been a staggering minority, and they've been the objects of scorn and derision for, for holding such a hope. The first thing we learn about him, as he rushes through the door of heaven on his way to Armageddon and then to the throne, is that he is faithful to keep his promises, and all that he has spoken is true. We will not abandon our confidence in the second coming of Jesus Christ. We will not allow the turning of the pages of the calendar to persuade us that the Bible is anything but absolutely true. The faithful one is coming. The one who speaks only truth is coming. Verse 11 also says, in righteousness, he doth judge and make war. This will be, this will be the first war ever fought where, where the, on one side, the combatants are absolutely righteous in all that they do. Now, now, you may have your favorite nation. Maybe it's yours. Maybe it's one you, you wish you were a part of. You, you may have your favorite war that you have studied, and, and you may, be, it may justify its cause. You may uh, argue for its principles. You may look and say, had we not fought that war, this would have happened, and, and the world would have been a much uh, more uh, terrible place than what it is. Uh, and, and, uh, setting all of that aside, there has never been a war where you could say side A was absolutely righteous, and those who waged that war were absolutely righteous, or side B was absolutely... There's never been a war like that. But when the faithful Lord Jesus Christ and the true Lord Jesus Christ comes back to wage war on behalf of the Father and the Word and the Holy Ghost, and, and he knows the hearts of men, and he does always those things that please the Father, and he knows the wicked ways of the opposition, and, and he has never sinned 
one time in all of eternity past, never will, all the way through eternity future, then he will wage war in righteousness. And the war that he rages, uh, wages will be a, a righteous conflict. Never been anything like that before. In the letter to Laodiceans, this, this is fascinating to me. Letter to Laodiceans, um, the Lord identifies himself as the faithful and true witness. That's chapter 3, verse 14. And he reproves and instructs the church. In Revelation 19, he is identified as the faithful and true warrior punishing his enemies. Heaven cannot be at peace with iniquity. And justice cannot be at amity with falsehood and rebellion. When sin is once incorrigible and incurable by any remedial measure, it must be put down by force of arms. Mercy, slighted and abused, brings on the executioner. So the world will band together in arms against the true king and will thus bring against itself the sword of insulted majesty. Christ will not fight as human kings and nations do. They, they wage their wars and they fight their battles out of, out of covetousness, pride, ambition for selfish greatness and dominion. But, but when Christ arises, mounts that horse, travels to Megiddo, he rises to fight in absolute justice, absolute righteousness. Because of his complete holiness, his waging war will be in the strictest accord with every holy principle and only for the purposes of bringing honor and glory to the Father. He will unsheathe uh, his sword, he will wield it in infinite power. Dreadful will be the carnage that follows, but it will be precisely what is merited and demanded. The powers of judging and making war are often separated in those who rule the world, but it's only a conventional separation. They necessarily go together after all. Wherever there is war, there is first a judgment made or entertained against those upon whom the war is to be made or on behalf of those whom it is to benefit. The general in the field is simply the sheriff and hangman of the court. So Christ is both judge and executioner, all power resting in one carried out in righteousness. To the church, he's the high priest. With the stars and the candlesticks, he's the minister of righteousness unto salvation. To the world, in armed rebellion, he is a mounted man of war. Exodus 15, verse number three. He's the minister of righteousness unto destruction. Yet in both, he is always Jesus Christ, the righteous. Now, let, let's pick one. Let, let's, let's pick a war here. Um, let's go with World War II, the part that people are familiar with. Uh, most people know about uh, Nazi Germany and America's war, entrance into the war, fight Nazi Germany, uh, Britain and the Allies fighting against Nazi Germany. and. And on the other side, most people know about um, Hitler and the, uh, the, uh, the persecution of the Jews and the, and the blitzkrieg overrunning of, of other countries. And, and a lot of people know about uh, Japan, the imperial emperor believed to be a deity 
and the attack upon Pearl Harbor and then the war in the Pacific. And so, so people know something about that war. They, they know little or nothing about the part the Soviet Union played in the war because for some reason, um, Hollywood just continually pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed for decades that we've got to stop Germany and we've got to stop Japan uh, while we were creating this and, and helping this monstrous USSR. Anyway, so Adolf Hitler and those on his side considered the, the circumstance, uh, uncontrollable inflation, um, terrible economic social uh, conditions brought about by uh, the consequences of the First World War. And, and they, they met together, they counseled together and said, you know, the, the right thing for us to do would be to invade these other nations and take advantage of their material uh, prosperity and see if we can dig ourselves out of this hole. And they, they got together and said, well, we need a scapegoat. And what better scapegoat than, than people that are secretly hated by uh, a lot of other people? And let's go after the Jew. And, and so there's counsel and there's a judgment made, and then the soldiers are armed, and the equipment is manufactured, and, and out roll the tanks and the troops. On the other side, on the other side, the United States, some of it, saw Nazi Germany as a problem, and they decided that we need to get involved in this war to save uh, democracy, <laughs> whatever that is, and to, to save uh, freedom, uh, that sounds good. Uh, in reality, it's really, really tough to have international trade if uh, people are sinking your ships in the Atlantic Ocean and, and bombing the factories that are making the goods that you're buying and so forth. And so anyway, so the U.S. said, here's a just cause. We've, we've, we've made a judgment. We need to go to war. And then they produce the materials and draft the men and send them out to fight the battles. And you could argue and you could prove the errors and the misjudgments and the uh, iniquity and the inconsistencies on both sides. I understand that. You can do that with any war. You can analyze it, pick it apart. Shouldn't have been fought, should have been fought this way and so forth. But Jesus Christ is going to wage war in righteousness in accord with the truth. He will make a determination. The only way there will ever be peace on earth is if I break the power of those who do not want to have peace on earth. The only way there will ever be righteousness in the earth is if I, the righteous one, go down there and take control. In order for me to take control and establish righteousness, I have to eliminate those who do not want me to be in control and have no desire for righteousness. And so a judgment is made by the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost. I must go to war. Jesus, Christ, there must be a war. We, we've got to stop these people. Now, here's the second great difference. He doesn't decide there needs to be a war and then send someone else to fight it. He doesn't decide we need to go to war to make the world safe for the masters of commerce and then send someone else's sons to take the brunt, shed the blood, do the fighting. The Lord Jesus Christ, having determined this is a righteous war and it needs to be fought, he himself comes to the battlefield and he himself wages the war and he himself puts down the enemies. He does not ask anyone else to do it for him. He does it himself. 
This will be an absolutely righteous military operation. This will be an absolutely just conflict. And maybe you've heard the term, (laughs) holy war. This will be the first 100% holy war because it will be fought by the holy Lord Jesus Christ. So look again at verse number 11. I saw heaven open. It's, it's, is it okay to say it's not really a fair fight? One army is coming from cradles, playpens, schoolyards. Now they've grown to manhood. They've got their mustaches, they've got their uniforms, but they are every bit, they they might number in the millions, but they are mortal men subject to death. On the other side, the very creator of the heavens and the earth. (laughs) On the other side, the one who holds all things together by the word of his power. If we stopped, if we read from Revelation chapter uh, 16 about the armies being gathered and read from chapter 19 about heaven opened and one man, one man showing up on a white horse. If we stopped right here and you didn't know the outcome, you'd never read the Bible, you'd never heard anything about the Word of God, and you went to place your bets would you bet on an army numbering several million soldiers? Or would you bet on one man on a horse with a sword? (laughs) Yes, but you're, you're forgetting one thing before you put down that wager. The one on that horse is the alpha, the omega, the beginning, the ending, He is the Lord God Almighty. I'll put my money on him. All right, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. Our website is jameswnox.org. That's where you can order our books, our recorded sermons, our Bible studies, our uh, witnessing tools, all, all the materials we have to help you Become a Christian or live the Christian life are there at jameswnox.org. If you're watching, thank you for subscribing. Thank you for those uh, notes of encouragement uh, that you uh, leave there in the comments section. We really, really do appreciate it. All right, 200 lessons in the can, as they say, and we'll press on next time. Hope you'll join us then. I'm Brother James. May the Lord richly bless you and good day.